Good morning, everybody. It is Palm Sunday, and it is kind of a celebration day for the church when we remember that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Uh, but before we crawl into that, what I wanted to do was, some of you may know that we had an event here yesterday. It was an Easter egg hunt, and here's what happened. We met as a staff several uh, months ago and began to plan this, and one of the blessings of the church that you're in is we don't really live by or have the phrase, this is the way we've always done it. Right. And so we sat down and Cindy, our new children's pastor, and said, hey, this is, we, we should do this. How do you want to do it? And she said, I don't really like the way we've done it. And I went, okay, how do we do it better? And we really wrestled with this. In fact, we were a little resistant. And uh, Cindy said, I want to try it. And so we said, you know what? Let's do it. And so she said, let's move it to Palm Sunday, the Saturday before. Let's get it off of Easter weekend, let's get it off of a Sunday, and let's do like a community event in which it's an outreach, and just see how many kids we can get, and just remind people that the church is in a scary place. And so we said, all right, that's what we'll do. And we, we looked at the date, I looked at the time, and I know there's soccer, and there's baseball, and softball, all these things going on that people uh, have trouble getting here for. And so I said, you know what, we should probably be happy if we have 25 kids. That is my exact quote, all right? And so yesterday, we set up 1,000 kids for the 20, or 1,000 eggs plus for the 25 kids that were coming, hoping that God surprised us. Uh, let me show you the next photo. Uh, this is not all the kids. We had somewhere between 400 and 500 kids here. It was incredible. Give God a big hand for that. Uh, and the reason I say between four and five hundred is because we couldn't get them to stand still to finish counting. So we're not really sure how many we want to. Okay, everybody's moving again. Who knows? Uh, in fact, we had so many kids that at one point in time we had to send uh, Michelle Kuhlman down to the uh, store to get some more eggs. So we were like, oh my gosh, we don't have enough eggs. Uh, it was just an amazing event and lots of people were here. Um, and lots of people got to just see the church, meet the staff. And uh, again, our goal was to say, hey, we're not such a terrifying place. And so we had a, a couple pictures. The other thing that was really cool was Debbie, who's currently leading our special needs ministry. Uh, for the first time ever, we had a special egg hunt for the special needs crew. And uh, that was really cool. And we can't show you a lot of photos there because most of those uh, individuals are not able to be uh, put public with their photo. But uh, we really had uh, just an amazing day yesterday. And again, many of you donated candy eggs. Uh, many of you were here stuffing eggs. Uh, many of you were here watching the chaos going, oh my gosh, there's more people showing up helping us park cars. And I, I just, I just want to say thank you. And if you get a chance, Cindy put in like 60 hours just to do this event. Your children's pastor put in like 60 hours to make sure this event went well. And so if you see her in the hallway or you, you really had a good time, just head on up to the children's room after the service and just say a special thank you to her. Uh, she went above and beyond to do this. And uh, again, just thank you for all that you did. If you volunteered, thank you, thank you. I know if you showed up as an adult and you were a member of the church, we pretty much put you to work. Uh, and so we... We appreciate that. We appreciate all you've done. Uh, so one of the things that we wanted to do was when we talk about Easter, one of the things that we began to think through was the fact that not everybody knows the basic story. Not everybody knows how it all fits together and how it all works together. And so what I wanted to do this morning was say, what if we took kind of an aerial view of the Easter story and then and then looked at it all put together in a way that makes sense. And this is how this went. <clears throat> I said to my wife what I was doing and she said, you know, I really like it better when Megan preaches because you're long-winded and I, you lose me. 
And I said to her, I'm sure there's an I love you somewhere in there. But Megan, you should know that my wife likes it much better when you preach. And, and she said, so when you do this, make sure that you, you help people stay with you. And so I spent all night. I staying up putting my artistic talent to work here. And I just want you to know that I will explain this in a way that makes sense. And that I, I, I probably don't even need to explain to you what I've drawn. But I, I want you to know that I will. For those of you that, again, don't have the artistic flair that I have and need a little bit more help incorporating my drawings into the message, okay? So I will work you through, and I promise today that I won't lose you, okay? So that's where we're at. We're going to take the, the big, again, big shot. Sometimes we focus on a passage or a little section of the Bible. <coughs> today we're, we're going to take the aerial view and say, how does this all fit together, okay? You ready? Okay. Uh, before we do that, though, before we do that, though, I don't know if you uh, read the news this morning or you listen to the news, but we need to take a moment and we need to pray. Uh, we had two Christian churches uh, bombed uh, in Egypt, uh, an ISIS attack uh, with uh, the ISIS group publicly declaring that their goal was to destroy all Christians. And that, uh, especially during this Holy Week, they declared a holy war against the Christian church. And again, we're going to come back and just talk about how there's a major difference between the world religions that exist. But I want to invite you to pray with me for our brothers and sisters around the world. Will you do that with me? God, we uh, choose not to ignore horror and tragedy around the world. And so we lift up our brothers and sisters who have been harmed. And we celebrate, uh, we celebrate the fact that You've welcomed some saints into heaven. And we lament the, the loss of the families. We pray that you be with them as they grieve and mourn. God, we pray for protection of the church. But Father, even more so, we pray for the witness of the church. That even in the midst of tragedy, your distinction as the holy loving God who came to sacrifice will be clear. And God, as those who died today now have their place, as Revelation says, under the, the altar in heaven with the other saints who have been martyred, who cry out, How long, Lord? May we cry with them this morning, awaiting your second coming. In Jesus' name, we celebrate this Easter, looking forward to your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. So I was about 13 or so years old, and the, we were playing basketball at the park. Now when I was a kid, the front porch of our house, literally you could stand on the front porch, look across the street to the small village that I grew up in, and see the park. And you could see what was going on at all times, and usually there was a basketball game going on. And we were there all the time. We were there all the time playing basketball, no matter what time it was. Late at night, street light came on. If we were over at the park, we were allowed to be there playing basketball. Early in the day, if you got there at 9 o'clock, that meant you got the first game. You got to pick the team, and so you played. And often, we would play right through lunch. Because if we were playing basketball, it didn't matter. And so dad would look out the uh, sidewalk uh, on the porch there, see we were playing basketball, and think to himself, hey, I don't have to feed him today. And he would move on with his day. The dysfunction was we came and ate everything in the refrigerator when we finally did get home. But, but that was just the way I grew up. I grew up, we were playing ball at the park all the time. And it was one of these August, summer, sticky, hot, gooey, ooey days. You know the type of day that I'm talking about? When you walk outside, you breathe and you start sweating. You know, that type of day. The type of day when you're playing basketball and you dribble the ball and it kind of melts into the court. And you have to replace your tennis shoes by the end of the day because all the treads literally dissolved into the ha hot asphalt that's there, right? That's the type of hot, nasty day it was. And I remember this story because I remember coming back from the park a little earlier than we did because everybody called it a day about 1 o'clock. It was just so hot and everybody's like, oh, we're thirsty, we're hungry, and we're all heading home. And several of the guys and gals that were playing ball came to our house. We often were kind of the stop water fountain. We lived in a village. The only place for a water fountain, they would have had to drill a well and we would have had to get it by buckets like a little house on a prairie. That's how old we are. At least my kids think so. And so we, we came to our house. It was a water fountain place. And I open the fridge door when I get in. And I haven't had a drink for several hours playing basketball on the hot asphalt. And there's this much left in a two-liter Pepsi bottle. 
If there's this much left in a two liter Pepsi bottle, you know what that means? You don't have to get a cup. That's what that means. That's like heaven for everybody, right? Especially a teenager. If there's this much, if there's this much left and there might be some left over after you're done drinking, you have to get a cup. But if there's only this much left and you've been playing basketball all day, you go, I can hammer all that right now, right? And I grab that dude out of the fridge and I think, oh, this is going to be great, right? And I pop the lid off of that and I pull it up and it's not the little sippy sip, right? I've been playing basketball all day. I am dying of thirst, right? And I start chugging that thing, the air bubbles are going, bloop, 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 right through that, right? You ever, you ever put something in your mouth, start eating or drinking something, and like some of it actually hits your belly? before the belly sends the signal back up saying, there's a, there's a danger, right? Something's wrong, seriously wrong. I, my belly talked to my throat, which went up to my taste buds, which finally communicated to my head, if you put any more of this in here, we may kill you. And I remember stopping suddenly and spitting and like almost vomiting it out. I mean, there was what was supposed to be Pepsi dripping from the, the, the tiles in the ceiling. You know, it was like, ah, one of those type moments. And I'm literally over the sink. And I'm scraping my tongue because whatever's in this is obviously poisoned. Right? This Pepsi has gone bad. And my dad hears the commotion. He comes into the kitchen. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't that. And he goes, oh, that's the coffee left over from last night. To this day, I can taste that in my mouth and think, Dear Lord, what's wrong with you, man? You don't put coffee in a Pepsi bottle. That's, that's sinful. It was not what I expected. It was not what I expected. One of the challenges when reading the gospel story is that often God behaves and acts in ways that we do not expect we want Thor, right? He's going to come down with a hammer and smash the bad guys, destroy the world. We want Hercules, half man, half God. He's got muscles and power and he's going to do amazing things, right? But God behaves in ways and acts in ways that often we don't expect. Now here's the danger. We have trouble believing him in him. And we often miss God because he was not what we were expecting. His power was not in force or dominance, or oppression. His power was not in force, or dominance, or oppression. We just prayed against a different world religion, which believes those are the highest values. Instead, Jesus came to offer you a third way that was in love and sacrifice. When someone says, aren't all world religions the same? They clearly have missed the core of values of those religions and the teachings of their main teacher. Jesus came not to oppress, not to dominate, or to say, I will force you to behave and live this way. He came in sacrifice and in love. Again, we often miss it because that's not what we were expecting when we read a story. We were expecting a hero to behave differently. Have you all seen one of those TV shows that starts with the end? You know, like it shows you the very end and then it goes to commercial and it shows you the intro of the show and then it begins back from where before the ending so that the whole thing is about getting to the end. That's what I want to do real quick. All right? I want to start at the end with you. Okay? I want to start at the end. I want to go to Revelation 21. If you have your e-vice, you want to join me there, that's great. If not, I'm going to throw it up on the screen. Jesus uh, has given the gospel author of John, John the Beloved, who also writes the book of Revelation, a vision. And in this vision, John records this for us. He says, I saw a new heaven. This is the very last book of the Bible, the very end. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. Remember, the sea in Genesis represents the chaos, the uncontrollable. And what he's saying is there's no longer chaos. There's no longer anything uncontrollable. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their 
God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be death, mourning, crying, or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, See, I am making everything, everything new. That's the end. That's the first scene you get to see of the show or the movie. The first chapter you read in the book where it started out with the end. And now we got to go, all right, how did we get there? Now, here's what I like to do. Whenever a book or movie does that, I always like to think during that commercial break or again, before I've read the next chapter, I wonder how we got here. And I like to play a little detective and say, okay, if that's the end, what do we know that's happened? If someone got shot, we know that there was a shooter, right? And we like to put some of those together, right? So here's what I want to do. I want to invite you to play detective with me for just a moment, okay? If the end has these three cores with it, there's a new heaven and new earth, we know that therefore there was an old heaven and old earth, right? You can't have a new without an old. Otherwise, it would just say there was a heaven and earth. But we have a new heaven and new earth. Second thing we know is that there's a new Jerusalem and there is a bride as part of this new Jerusalem. And so there was a bride, alright, there was a bride who's going to have a wedding. If she's going to have a wedding, there must have been some kind of courtship, some kind of relationship thing going on. This must be about a relationship. So the second point we get from Revelation is that not only is there a new heaven and new earth, but there's, this is all about relationships. The third piece is that God, who appears to have been separated, right? Because his dwelling place will now be among his people. It must not have been at one time. So apparently at one time, God and the people were separated, right? And then it brings in this just happily ever after moment. There'll be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The old order has th things have passed away. And so when I read that, I also then finally go, you know what? Therefore, the story that we're about to read, or the show we're about to watch, is it going to be a story about absolute joy and peace and harmony and butterflies and flying unicorns? Or is it going to be a story about suffering and pain and hardship? This would be where you answer. Which one is it going to be? Yeah. You can't have the end be about, hey, there'll be no more mourning, crying, or pain if that didn't exist previously. If there wasn't hardship and struggle previously, the end where there's no more of it doesn't make sense. And so at the very end or the intro to the show today, we know that, hey, these are things that God is putting right. These are things that God is putting right. And it's going to be a story about struggle. That is the story that you and I lived in. Now, here, pause, because at this point, the skeptic walks in and says, See, it's a fairy tale. Pretty soon, Red Riding Hood is going to show up, and she's going to eat porridge with the three bears. I mean, they're going to have Goldilocks stepping down into the story, and there's going to be the big bad wolf who suddenly becomes harmonized. Again, everybody's going to get along in the story. Right? It's, just, it's just another fairy tale, right? You can't believe in this. You can't trust it. You can't take it as reliable stories. In the end is just like every other fairy tale with the apparently a happily ever after ending, right? You can't have this. G.K. Chesterton, one of the famous preachers of the 20th century, said this responding to such comments about it may be a fairy tale, excuse me, a fairy tale. All of a sudden I went Princess Bride on us there. He said it might be a fairy tale, but it is actually just a glimpse of art. And he says this, Lost somewhere in the enormous plains of time, there wanders a dwarf, who is the image of God, who has produced on a yet more dwarfish scale the image of creation, we call that art. The pygmy picture of God we call man, and the pygmy picture of creation we call art. No wonder we begin to lose the truth from reality when God created us to be so imaginative. But again, the argument is you can't have reason and faith together. Rabbi Zacharias responds, no, you can. They are not enemies. He says, God has put enough into the world God has put enough into this world to make faith in him the most reasonable stance. But he's left enough out to make it impossible to live with reason alone. He's left enough out to make it impossible to live with reason alone. And so we look at it and go, well, is it a fairy tale? How do we know? 
how do we begin to distinguish between the fairy tale and right and wrong? We're going to come back to that in just a second. Here's an interesting point though. Our story begins with the end. And the end is heaven. I really struggled. I had a couple different drawings and I just couldn't draw anything that I thought looked like heaven. So I thought I'll just write the word heaven because I'm talking to a literate group. All right? And so we start with heaven. But then we move to Palm Sunday. Where Jesus begins to get us to the end. Where Jesus begins to get us to the end. Where Jesus begins to get us to the end. Our Palm Sunday story is of the king who rides in not what we were expecting. We were expecting a world power of oppression. We celebrate Palm Sunday knowing that Jesus rides in. It's a major victory, right? And he could come in on a, a giant raging bull. Right? That would be a great story. Like I would read that to my kids. And then Jesus came into Jerusalem, a bucking bull. And he tamed that bull and tamed the evil. And woo! What a cowboy, right? Or at least come in on Babe the Blue Ox, right? I mean, that would be cool too. Like this giant blue ox. And they said, and never before has anybody seen anything like this, right? Or even like a lightning bolt. If Jesus came in riding a lightning bolt, that would be cool. At the very least, do what the Romans did. At least find a stallion that looks intimidating, right? But we said at the beginning of the story that Jesus is going to do the unexpected. We also reminded ourselves that if the world motive and method of Jesus was oppression and violence and force and dominance, that you and I would parent differently. You and I would behave differently. But Jesus chose a different path. And so Jesus enters in on a donkey. Now to help you understand, Jesus enters in on Eeyore. Okay, now, just, I want to help you see this. This is clearly Eeyore because it has no tail. Okay, if it had a tail, we could have said that was a horse. All right, but that is clearly Eeyore because it has no tail. Now, I want you to picture this. Here's Jesus marching in with this mighty parade, and everybody sees the disciples part, right? And then Jesus is on a donkey with his feet dragging on the ground. Don't you go, whoa, there's a mighty king. Go get him, Jesus. Home run time, right? I look at that and go, um... You got backup, right, Jesus? Because, like, that donkey, I mean, I could outrun that donkey, Jesus. This is not a very intimidating thing. And that's the point. It's not intimidating at all. Jesus is saying, you are free to reject me. You've heard the saying, if you really love someone, eventually you have to be willing to let them go. Right? Because love doesn't force, abuse, oppress, or dominate. Love says, you are free to Accept and return my love whenever you want. Because only then is it real love. So our story moves from heaven to the donkey. Our story moves from heaven to the donkey. All right? But again, we want to go back. How is it not a fairy tale? I mean, this is now a goofy story, right? We, should, we don't have the hero show up with a mighty lightning bolt or baby blue ox or, or even a horse. He rides in on a donkey. This is one of those goofy fairy tales, right? How do we know it's not a fairy tale? How, how do we know what we discern from history and reality? I mean, we teach our kids that there are talking fish that ride turtles to another part of the country to save a loved one, right? We teach them that there are, are lion-like beasts that we dance, and when we finally fall in love and kiss them, they turn back into humans, right? We, we tell them this all the time. And then we have the story about this Jesus fellow who does miracles and lives and dies and is resurrected. I mean, how does it not get lost in the midst of all the other stories we tell? How do we know what what's true and what's not. When we go back in history, this is the place where Christianity stands unique among all religions and that we can trace it back into history. That God became vulnerable enough to say, you can locate me in history. You can locate me in people, places, things, times, and languages. God became vulnerable and left himself open for attack or also open for us to discover evidence and therefore go, it is a reasonable logic faith. Here's what we know from both scripture and non-biblical sources. That there was a man named Jesus who lived around the 30s AD. He lived, he taught, he did some things that were miraculous, as so some believed, and then he died. And then after his death, there was an event which was so amazing that it revolutionized the world. Here's what John, the gospel author, says about 
the event of Jesus' death, writing in John 19. He says, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished so that the scripture would be fulfilled, John had Jesus record, I am thirsty. A jar of wine and vinegar was there, so they soaked the sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant. And they lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It is finished. Now, you don't say it's finished unless you were working on a project or you had a mission to complete, right? Otherwise, Jesus would say, This is tragic! This isn't how I wanted it to go. I'm dying. Woe is me. And then he began to sing, Always look on the bright side of life. Right? That's how, for the four of you that know what I'm talking about, right? Right? All right, we wouldn't have this end, but instead Jesus was on the cross and he makes a mission completed statement. It is finished. What I sought out to do, I have done. Jesus on the cross is in complete control. So again, just to walk you through, we have the end. We have Jesus' entrance on a donkey, which leads him to the cross, which says there was a mission that he completed on the cross. Again, if we're going to be good detectives in the movie, we have to go, well, what was the mission then? Again, we got to rewind yet one more step. You ever watch the videos where they rewind? <laughs> Thought I'd throw that in there for those of you who were, oh, that's cool. The rest of you are going, we've got to get a new pastor. This guy's on drugs. Right. We have Jesus' statement that it is finished on the cross. What's finished? Again, we talk about the mission of Jesus, which is completed. Let's go all the way back to the first chapter of John. The very intro of the gospel of John to find out what the mission was. This is what John speaks of when he talks about the mission. John, the author of the gospel, records John the Baptist, who is not the same guy, saying this about Jesus when he sees him. John the Baptist looks at Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who comes to take away the sin of the world. All the way back at the beginning of the story, John's birth story, that's Jesus' baby in a manger right there, that's what I know you didn't need me to tell you that, but that's what it is, okay? That's, that's Jesus, and you see the little hands and head and feet. All right? That's Jesus in a manger. All the way back to the very beginning of the story, John declares that Jesus came human. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and came to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, just to recap, to get us to the end, we have to go to Eeyore, we have to go to the cross, we have to go to Jesus being the Lamb of God to get to the end. What was the end? Remember, there's a bride that has been separated from her lover. It is a relational language. It is a God who now comes to dwell with us. The previous part of the story had dying, mourning, weeping, crying, much of pain. To get to the heaven end, we had Jesus go through all of this to die on the cross as the Lamb of God for the word we use is atonement. To restore our relationship with God. He does the unexpected. To get to the end, we needed the Lamb of God to make atonement. To get to the end, we needed the Lamb of God to make atonement. If we want to enjoy this, Jesus had to ride to here. To die there, he had to become one of us. And then we celebrate today, and we're going to celebrate the Seder meal again on Good Friday. We're actually going to have a mock Seder meal. To enjoy this, Jesus leaves us with this physical statement of love. Jesus says, at what we call the Last Supper. A supper celebrating the Passover meal where the lamb was to be sacrificed. I'm going to hop off the stage here. Nobody get excited, okay? Jesus takes bread and he's reenacting the Passover meal. And he takes the bread and he breaks the bread as was tradition in the Passover meal. And he hands it to his disciples and he says to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. 
Take and eat of it. It is given for you. Take and eat of it in remembrance of me. Now we celebrate and we know that this doesn't actually become the body of Christ. It is a symbol. Jesus is using symbolic language saying, this is my body. It is broken for you. Take and eat of it. It is to destroy your sins and restore the broken relationship with God. A little bit later during the meal, Jesus took a cup and he poured it out and he gave thanks and he lifted it up, blessing God. And then he said this amazing thing, the unexpected thing. Something the disciples weren't ready for. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the covenant, the new covenant. It is poured out for you. Take and drink of it. So Jesus walks us through this, this grand story. Again, from way up high, we see the pieces begin to fit together. Or if we want to get to the happy ending... Jesus had to ride Eeyore to the cross. There upon the cross, Jesus dies as an atonement for our sins. Why did Jesus die? Because we go back to the very beginning. Because he came as the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God whom was celebrated and eaten at the Passover meal. And Jesus takes that Passover meal and says, Once this reminded you of an escape out of Egypt and the deliverance of God out of Egypt, now it shall remind you forevermore of what I'm about to do on the cross. And every time you eat the Passover meal, may you remember when you look at a cross that my body was broken upon that cross for you. May you remember every time you look at the cross that my blood dripped down that cross for your sins because I loved you this much. I didn't come to dominate you. I didn't come to force anything upon you. I didn't come to oppress you. I didn't come to body slam you. I came in sacrificial love. And then he says this, if you want to be my church, behave the same way. And the rest of the world should be able to look and go, wow, we see other religions and other worldviews behave like that, but the Christians behave in sacrifice and love. Fifteen years ago, Rabbi Zacharias made a prophecy. And I read it and remembered it because I was just so startled by it. He said, there'll be a day when there's no longer the atheist, and there's no longer the Hindu, and there's no longer the Buddhist. There'll only be two left. He said, there'll be the Islamic religion, and he said, there'll be Christianity. And he said, the distinction will be that one wants to oppress and overpower and force, and the other one lives by love and sacrifice. You are part of the sacrifice and the love. Today we remember that as we take Jesus' bread and body that is broken and the juice which is poured out as the blood of God. My mother said her worst nightmare was that she would be driving a car and it would go off the road and into the river. And she would have to rescue her children and she wasn't able to get to them all. She said, I just woke up feeling that fear. I have good news for you today. The car did go off the river for us in life, but our holy God died on the cross and is able to rescue every one of us. But in doing so, he chose to give up his life and called us to do the same. To say this life is not worth living if it is apart from God. So I invite you to take up your cross this Holy Week. To chase after Jesus. To run after Jesus. That fathers will live sacrificially for their families. That they'll choose to stay in the mess. That mothers will say, I'm going to give sacrificially to my family. That will choose to say, I'm going to behave different at work. That will choose to say, I'm going to choose to behave different in politics. That I'm going to choose to behave different because Jesus gave us the example of a sacrifice and a love that did so. May this be how the world recognizes us and sees Jesus in us. In the name of God the Father, may you go forth and behave differently because of the grace and glory of our Master. In Jesus' name you are blessed. Amen.